mentioned was how uh, in one of the earlier workshops, uh, the, someone floated the idea of uh, a Congress, Congress representatives will be home this week. So it would be a great time to get together with some people and actually do with handcuffs a citizen arrest of all these guys that are vote and women that are voting uh, to, to fund the war. This terrible, terrible act of criminality that's been going on for five years. Um, and even some of them that voted no will probably turn around and vote yes and then send that footage to YouTube uh, because then thousands or not hundreds of thousands will see it and if enough people see it, it actually could get then picked up by the networks. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea. Unfortunately, it, we're probably coming up with it a little late in the game, but if people don't get it together fast enough this, this coming week, um, they could make perhaps at least uh, get ready to do it during the 4th of July recess when they, they're also at home and it would blend really well with the 4th of July being our independence holiday and founding the air independence with this very corrupt government. Uh, and the Congress is the enablers of the Bush Cheney regime. So go to uh, convictbushcheney.org and let uh, Dave Swanson know you're, well, you want to work on this. And he'll probably put you in touch with other people in your congressional district. And if you see him during dinner, let him know that you're willing to help. Because he really is very understaffed and needs, needs help. And it will be a way of combining some fun with, I think, a very smart, media-wise uh, tactic. The other one is that was thrown out was actually investigating um, what citizens can do to actually get a uh, convene a federal grand jury in their uh, federal district court area. Do you know anything about what it takes to do that? No. Nobody, nobody seems to know. But um, uh, of oh, the resource for that? Yeah. But in here is FIJA, Fully Informed Jury Association. Uh -huh. And they help educate people how powerful the jury is. Judges cannot assess evidence. Juries can. And people knew the, uh, they have, the power they have. It's more powerful than a judge. He can make some real decisions. Yeah. And it was jury nullification. No, no, fully informed jury association. They, the Fiji. jury can also find a person innocent even though they may be guilty of breaking the law. The jury does not have to just take the law into account in all situations. Well, anyway. But he's just saying that they're the trier of facts, and the judge is usually the trier of evidence Procedure. in terms of the law, what yeah. the law is. Procedure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But, um, see, there was one other thing. Uh, uh, oh, it's really good to go to his website after downingstreet.org because uh, they're actually, uh, you all heard about Brattle Grove, Vermont, just passing uh, a resolution to impeach, no, to arrest the citizens that were allowed to arrest Bush and Cheney if they step grounds within their, their uh, community to make a citizen's arrest. But he said there's actually, I think, 100 state parties that have passed impeachment. Uh, resolutions and several other cities um, and there's a lot of very inspiring stuff on his website that you don't hear about in the corporate media in terms of local actions to really get something going on this impeachment process and then the whole other way is indicting these guys even though uh, it may, the impeachment process may not be as practical indictment certainly is and uh, our, our President Attorney General uh, the case notwithstanding and, and it would certainly be uh, Call for for no other reason than protect our Constitution. And uh, so many people just sort of fall for, well, he's going to be out in four months anyway. This is it started in September. Uh, why bother? Well, why bother is because otherwise uh, we're basically throwing away the Constitution and we're letting the next presidency just build on uh, the same uh, terrible things that this one has done. So, anyway, who I am, uh, just real quick. I uh, started out as sort of an organizer, um, and, uh, and I, I organized the first alternative school in California using the community as a school. So I started as kind of a community organizer, and um, then I moved into doing a variety of things. I was trying to kind of a renaissance man, so I was a singer-songwriter, and then I was a paramedic, and then I was a college teacher. And then what I really got serious about was being an, uh, an investigative journalist filmmaker. So for 14 years I did documentaries, uh, ended up starting in Hawaii, moving to Washington, D.C., 
and of course, in that, I learned about publicity and doing fundraising and sort of all these different things that make up sort of components of a kind of a social change movement. Um, and all the time being a very, very serious, you know, guy. And I still am. Still looking for my problems. Um, but uh, I, I, what? I was just saying, yes, infuse humor in the next. Yes. And, uh, and then I, I came up with an idea of, of a TV series that I actually thought could do more social good than documentaries, which was called World's Best Free Fun. Uh, it's kind of Web 2.0, those of you who know about the internet, sort of the idea of tapping the wisdom of the masses. So anytime anyone had an idea of a new way to have fun, they'd have a TV show they could send this fun idea to. That'd be easy, free, original, um, kind of like one level better than Funniest Home Video. And I thought, well, this is not political, but it could generate millions of dollars for activist causes. And uh, because even Gandhi said it takes a lot of money to keep me in poverty, and I've always felt <laughs> yeah, any effective social change was good fundraising. And um, I developed this series. Unfortunately, Disney stole the series, but I did end up writing this book, which was a spinoff of it. But it got me thinking a lot about fun. And, um, and then on the back, it talks about profits going to causes, that kind of thing. Um, and then I, uh, I started noticing an interesting thing that was happening in terms of social change in this country. The first thing was the meetup uh, revolution with the Howard Dean campaign. And Howard Dean was sort of, and Joe Trippi, his, his campaign manager, being the first to really see the power of the internet for getting democracy back to the people. And then the next big move after that was uh, move on uh, and, and, and not only doing the uh, uh, move on thing that you all are familiar with, but having house parties and being able to have 6,000 house parties in one weekend. And I would go to a lot of these because I lived in the Bay Area, so that we were very, when we got started, and so it was very heavily hot. So I could go to six house parties easily in one night, or sometimes it would be over two nights on the weekend. And I, I had this uh, um, epiphany, or, or actually started out with a frustration that I'd meet people at these house parties that were frustrated that at the house parties, move on did not ask us to do anything beyond that. And uh, I, I had this epiphany probably in the shower the next morning where, you know, at that house party, if people were asked to give house parties and, and told that we want these 5,000 house parties to become 10,000 house parties in three weeks, so can we get two people from this house party to agree to do a house party? Um, and keep doubling like that, and probably because the people were there wanting to be asked to do stuff. They were excited, and, uh, and that never happened. And I, then I had this next epiphany. I said, well, what's, I started talking to people about this, because you've got to really bounce off things. And really, uh, if you're really going to come up with creative ideas, it's a group thing. And I had feedback saying, well, the problem with house parties is they're too labor intensive. Uh, to do a house party, you've got to first provide a place. You've got to invite a bunch of people, you have to set up, you have to clean up, you got to do the pitch, and any of those four steps are going to eliminate people. A lot of people don't want to talk to them, ask their friends for money, they don't even want to talk to strangers. A lot of other people don't want to bother setting up and cleaning up. A lot of people think that they have to have a big place, they don't realize that even an apartment for 10 people is 10 times better than no house park at all. And then there's people that don't have that many people they could invite. So I said, why not break that down four functions of doing a house party into four different things. So you have on your, you go to houseparties.org, you'll see this. Uh, but let's see it again. So on your home page, you have um, And I call this basically, I call this Henry Ford meets Tupperware, because it's a division of labor. So you have one button that says uh, host, meaning provide a place. You have another button that says invite. And you have another button that says give a pitch. And then you have another one that says set up or clean up. And you just choose which of these, so nobody really has to do that much work. By division of labor, the idea of giving a house party into one thing, and then thank God for the internet and software and databases you put in your zip code, and it will mate you with the three other people that will do the other things that you won't do or don't want to do. You immediately uh, can 
possibly double or triple the number of people willing to give house parties. Um, and then I had this another epiphany uh, many months later, uh, thinking about, well, the movement is always so serious. You know, it's always so serious. Why not have uh, a fifth function, which would say provide surprise entertainment? And then underneath that, you have a hyperlink saying you don't have to be a star. And then you click on that and it says you can bring copies of the song that everybody knows. Bring the lyrics. The old McDonald had a farm. I mean, any kind of song that everybody knows. Uh, you can bring us a, a, a moving poem, a moving short story. You can tell a joke. I mean, lots of things that anybody could do to add more creativity, add more fun, add more connection, and counter the sort of celebritization of our culture, which is really taking all the fun and, and all of the, to me, the essence of, of culture out of our society and, and turned it into a bunch of, of spectators. Um, and and then the, the most exciting thing is that at the house party itself, you can do the same process without the internet. Just saying, and I've done this on about six different parties, I said, how many people here, I said, wouldn't it be nice if this party could double, and if all the parties could at least double three weeks from now, so that the 500 parties we're having this weekend could become 1,000, then 2,000, then 4,000, then 8,000, then 16,000. Imagine what that could do to the country if you could get up to those kind of numbers. We can do that if this party alone will just double in three weeks. So to make that happen, how many of you would open your house to a place if other people would do all these other things? And all of a sudden, you get a lot more people saying, sure, if I don't have to do anything, so I open my and then you remind people, because most people nowadays live in small apartments or small houses, you say, you don't have to have a big, even if it only has 10 people, it's 10 times better than no house party at all. Because one of those people, for example, could have inherited a million dollars and be wondering what they could do in the war or whatever. Um, so that's sort of one of these smarter, more fun ways to organize. It's smarter because you can actually take a small number of house parties, use a sort of Tupperware, Amway networking thing, actually keep doubling them to get into huge numbers. At those house parties, you'd be, you'd be increasing your membership of your organization, you'd be educating people with a neat video, you'd be raising money, and you'd be recruiting people to ongoing committees, state-based committees, to really create an or whether it's for you know, single-payer health care, getting us out of Iraq, preventing further global warming, you know, whatever your issue is. And my dream is to actually get some of the major organizations in each of these areas together plus the two most important process issues, which you never hear anybody talking about, publicly funded elections, getting rid of our corrupt campaign finance system, and having a truly democratic campaign finance system, and getting rid of the voting machines, and having a system of voting that's truly honest. Um, because without those two things, you're not going to get the end of the war, you're not going to get real serious stuff for preventing the war, you're not going to get any of the content stuff, single care, health care. And having them all unite, and flip a coin as to which goes, which has the first round, second round, third round, but they all basically share the money at the end and put it to escrow. To me, it's all doable and it would unite all the groups together because that's what we really sorely need. So that's that's one. Um, any questions about we well, actually let me go back to that later if you have questions. And what, and I should have mentioned an agenda for this is basically I'm going to throw out three or four ideas to kind of get your juices working, then I'm going to ask you to come up with some ideas, to try to create some ideas. It could be something you've heard of, or something you're kicking around, or something right here and now. You, we can try to invent or add to this. Um, and my real goal, the reason I moved from California out here, is to create a center. Uh, right now, the working title is Smart, More Fun Ways to Organize, of people who will simply, in a group process, collaborate and create more fun, more smarter ways to organize, and then get these tried out, implemented by grassroots organizations. Um, and because I think, as I said in one of the other workshops, um, you know, in the battle between so-called the forces of evil and the forces of good, there's only one thing that's ever made any real difference, and that's organizing. And so the, if we're ever going to have any success to change this country, to save the planet, we've got to get a lot better at organizing. And for good people to do nothing. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what organizing is, is it gets all the kind of apathetic people that are sort of marginal to get involved. And by the way, a lot of people say, well, there's some people that are just they're so ingrained, I'm never going to change them. You know, they're, they're just, they don't get it. And so my answer to that is, well, don't worry about them. You know, don't waste your time with them. It's the first thing you learn as an organizer is you want to speak to the people that are movable. 
if you look at the civil rights movement, you look at the women's rights movement, you look at the anti-Vietnam movement, all the successful movements you know, in the last 30, 40 years, we never had more than 3 or 4% of the public actually on the streets or working in the campaign offices. You don't have to have you know, a lot of people to, to change this country, but you do need to get at least 3% of the people really activated. So we're after, right now we're, I'm guessing, at a percent and a half. So we so really only have to get not that many more people involved. And, uh, and we have to get smarter, though, and more fun on how we do it. Uh, uh, the second one was a, um, on the second one is just actually it's a host of different ones that, that fit under the general rubric of office games. And there are already books out on that. I got a whole chapter on office games. But there's an a author named David uh, Henset that has a whole book, 301 ways to make office life more fun. Because in a campaign office, whether it's whether it's stopping the war or whether it's getting somebody elected or whether it's uh, single payer health care, it comes down to a campaign management office where you have three, four, five, six people working together out of that office. So it's still office life. So how do you make office life more fun? There are lots of ways to make office life more fun. And most Americans spend their life in offices. Um, so you can uh, get that. That's probably a better book than what I have, because I just have a chapter of maybe 10 or 15 office games. He's got a whole book of them. There are ways to make office life more fun. And I give some examples later if you want. Um, a, uh, another one would be uh, a Okay, this is, I haven't figured out how to make this, well, actually this, this is, I have figured out a little bit how to make this fun. It's, it's, it's really strong in the smart dimension, but it could be more fun. Um, and I got this idea when I was uh, lobbying Conyers office about impeachment. And, uh, and I talked to this guy who actually remembered me because I used to live in D.C. a long time ago. We had a really good rapport. And he said, you know, Gary, you'd be surprised. We actually don't get that many letters. I know there's a lot of people out there that think Bush should be impeached, but we, Conyers actually doesn't get that many letters asking him to get at Conyers, those of you who don't know, is the head of the Judiciary Committee, the committee that really should be doing something about impeaching. And, uh, and so Conyers has not really taken much action because there's a lot of downsides for him to do this. Um, and I, I said, you know, I'm thinking about writing letters. And, and as activist as I am, I don't write nearly the number of letters I should. I, I rarely write letters. And I don't know why. I, say, I would say to myself, I'm going to write a letter tonight, and I don't. And I said, you know, we have, if I'm having a hard time writing letters, imagine the rest of the public. I said, we've got to figure out a way to make letter writing a lot easier. And by the way, emailing is only about a 50th as effective as a letter okay, or a fax. They've done studies on this. If they get hard snail mail letters or faxes, that's way more effective than an email, off of which they don't even read until after the vote because they get so backlogged on their emails. Um, so I thought one day, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was a website, it's kind of a one-stop shop website where you, you click on, the one button would say something like, um, By the way, these are all great websites if you're concerned uh, conservative vote fraud. That's why I'm not. You should get one of these before you do. That's my other passion. Is I'm, I'm actually spending a lot of my spare time trying trying to uh, raise money to actually nail the guy that we know now has been hacking the, the tabulators and swing states and hacking the vote. Um, but let's, let's say you had uh, uh, issues this week or this month or this in the next two weeks. I'm sorry about my handwriting. I know I should have been a doctor. But, uh, so you find out what Congress is... is hmm? Put the top on in between your okay. It would be so hard to... All right. Um, and you, thanks. And, and you find out what are the issues that the House or the Senate could be voting on this week. And then you click on the issue that you're concerned about. And then it, and it has sample letters. 
and there'd be, you know, one would be pro and one would be con, because, you know, this would be a site that anybody, Republican or Democrat, could go to. The advantage of that, I mean, I'm, I, it could be argued that we should just make it progressive, but the, one thing that's interesting about it is that if we get everybody going about to it, then more people are going to be telling word of mouth marketing is the most effective form of marketing. So we'll have Republicans mentioning this to other people, and some progressives will overhear it, and vice versa, maybe. But I think basically the main assumption of democracy is that the more everyone is involved, the more the country is going to be more compassionate, more concerned with justice. And the reason most of the injustice happens, we have a very small number of the super rich and the power elite who are going to be running the show. So we have to believe it's all right to let the Republicans know about this as well, I think. Um, and so you click on this, and it gives you a sample letter. And then, it, it, then there's a zip, there's a zip code thing here, and and that gives you your representative, tells you who your representative is to write uh, or to write to. And, and then the fourth step would be uh, connect me. And the connect me. This is the real. Uh, uh, power here and the fun part here is that, uh, and I got this idea from seeing how Obama is very, very clever. When you make a donation to Obama, uh, I don't, you know more about this story than I do, but it, you get it, you have the option or automatic, it, it, it sells you right away. If you make, uh, donate X amount of money, three other people will match your, your, your donation. So there's a big incentive to donate, but what's really the neat thing is that you automatically get letters from these people right. saying, I just matched your donor, thank you very much. Right. You know? So uh, wouldn't it be neat? And, it, and I've met people who really like that. You know, They get this kind of it's, it's social networking, uh, tapping the best of what social networking can do to make for uh, fundraising. But wouldn't it be nice if the same thing could apply to letter writing where if you write a letter uh, asking Congress to get more active on impeaching Bush, and then you click on Connect Me, and the system knows your zip code, uh, and you might, and it'll probably have an option of, uh, you know, five mile radius, ten mile radius, whatever you want to, and you'll find other people that have also written Conyers that month or even that year, and uh, that you might want to know about. They might want to know about you, so it helps basically tap the value of community and connection uh, and use that as a reinforcer for letter writing. I'm just curious, how many people would be more motivated to write a letter if you knew that you could be connected with other people that have written a similar, that similar letter? So I think that would be kind of neat. Um, and uh, um, Saying, by the way, when you're, when you're hearing this, you're making, I'm just sort of conceptualizing this right now. Did anyone think of any ways to make this even more fun or better or more effective? I think combining your house party and your letter writing. Uh -huh. So there could be an option of, uh, if I'm hearing you right. No, you're not hearing me right. Have a house party for an issue, and then have the letter writing as the outcome. At the house so party, yeah. You said people want to do stuff. Right. Well, that's something that they actually yeah. can do, and yeah. it has an impact. Right then and there, yeah. That'd be great. And after you've written your first letter, it's a lot easier to do it again. Yeah. yeah. And whoever you're writing to has heard from you before, and if you're, you know, kind of reasonable, then you know when you actually run into them sometime. Then um, they've got context to listen to. Yeah, I'm also thinking that this could also go to um, a house party site, and it would basically say, "Do you, what would you like to uh, join or host a house party that where we're going to write letters, you know, to get other people to write the kind of letter you wrote." Um, any other uh, suggestions for improving this idea? Before I forget, what's central to most of these ideas, they're not all internet-based, by the way, but most of them are um, internet-based. And I should, I should say that sort of the area that most fascinates me is you've got you know, the meetup campaign with Move On, you've got all this activity now on the internet for organizing people. And then you've got 100 years of old-fashioned door-to-door, face-to-face organizing that unions have been doing and campaigns have been doing since 
you know, democracy started in the, you know, the last 100, 200 years. And, and there's sort of two separate worlds. Um, they kind of unite with electoral campaigns where you have uh, database software that voter IDs and then hands that stuff to the canvassers. But other than that, there's sort of two separate worlds. And what fascinates me is the potential of uniting these worlds, of, of where they can overlap. That's why this house party idea is interesting because it creates, it uses the internet to set up a uh, larger than normal number of house parties, but then you do the same system that's on the house, the homepage, you do that actually face-to-face -face at the party, and that's where you get the double. So it's kind of a nice combination of the, to the power of both things that fascinates me. Um, and I know, you know, I have not been able to get a major organization to go for this, but I've gotten very close because Sims campaign actually wanted to go for it, his financer, and he wanted to go for it, but his, his IT director was burnt out, as a lot of IT directors you know, are in campaigns. Um, the head of the NRDC liked it, but he couldn't get his IT guy to do it. Uh, so one thing I know I need for this to really get off the ground is to get you know an activist-oriented programmer, uh, that's or two, so we don't have to ask too many hours from any one of these guys one of these women, but if you know someone with that kind of talent that can spare 10 or 15 hours a week, um, that's what our organization needs. And we've got three already very impressive people who can be on our board of advisors. One of them is uh, Zach Axley, who's like one of the main uh, people who was behind Mulan, and he is with them anymore, but where it's going. So, um, uh, does anyone here know any programmers? Okay, so well, I'll, I'll talk to you. and I will talk later. Um, another thing I thought of, and this is really just still germinating, is based on the organization the principle of catching someone doing something right. You're already the one minute manager, some of you read, probably read the one minute. Anyway, most organizational management classes always teach the principle that rather than punishment and haranguing and cajoling and, and persuasion, uh, and this is also a principle of raising children, it's best to do positive reinforcement, catch the person doing something right and give them a lot of reward for it. So I'm thinking, next time, if, if there was a system so that when I went to Starbucks, and I always try to carry my own metal or ceramic thing, uh, I saw someone else that had their own ceramic or their metal thing, or for that matter, at, at, at the cash register, asked for their coffee on the ceramic rather than this habit we all have of using automatically taking things in paper and styrofoam cups, which by the way it takes 18 million gallons of gas. See, that, that habit that Americans have is incredibly destructive to, to the planet. Same thing with shopping bags. Shopping bags, paper and plastic bags, another almost 18 million gallons of gas to produce all those bags. And then of course you, you think you're doing something by recycling them, that's what more gasoline, more oil to recycle them. So the only real answer, the answer for that is cloth bags and for drinking is your own your own bug. Um, so I would say, wouldn't it be interesting if, if you saw somebody doing something right like that at Starbucks or a coffee shop, and you could give them a tag, a little card, maybe your business card. And on your business card, there would be a, a website called uh, something like uh, Catch Me Doing Something Right. I don't know, I haven't thought of the name of it yet. Um, and, or if I did, I forgot what it is right now. But it would be a website you could go to and you put in this code, and I, and then you would uh, give you so many points. And if enough people gave you, if you did enough good things during the day, during the week, during the month, you could, you could trade these points in for services that people like me who join the website would be willing to offer. This is kind of like time dollars or Ithaca hours. Have you ever heard of those concepts where people are basically uh, replacing money with services, trading services? or things, trading things and services and trying to get rid of the money-based uh, economy. Um, so for example, I could put on there that I'm willing to invite, everybody can do this, you can invite someone over for dinner. Now, cu couples and women are not going to probably want to, actually most people are probably not going to want to do this to, to nowadays, to strangers, but you, but you probably could say, well, if you're a woman or a couple, you can come over for dinner. Okay, that's one thing everybody can do. If you're a Let's say you're a carpenter, you say, I'm willing to do two hours of carpentry. If you're a plumber, I'm willing to do an hour of plumbing. And, it's, and you sign how many points these things are worth. If, 
you're a psychotherapist, I'm willing to give you an hour of psychotherapy. If you're a lawyer, maybe an hour of lawyering, whatever. And he's already, so once you've got enough points by doing the right things, riding a bus, having a hybrid car, which would give you a lot of points every time you saw it, someone's hybrid car in the parking lot, you can slap your car and you just won X amount of points. Um, I think that'd be really interesting. It would create kind of a real buzz. A lot of the, it gets certainly a lot of media attention and it could really catch on in an interesting way. What do you, what do you think? That's you're great. you're a fellow system. entrepreneur, would you? With that idea? Or? Yeah, that idea. What does anybody think? But I mean, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I guess, I, I guess, I guess, from the onset, the at least from my elementary understanding of that the concept, it's just that. Um, I mean, one one hour. I mean, it, it, it's very subjective to say one hour of someone's work is worth the hour of someone else's work. And so, for instance, I would say there would be like a lot of evaluation, like in that case, with psychotherapy, it would depend, you know, like what one hour of psychotherapy be equivalent to maybe like more point two five hours of some expert legal opinion based on, given that you're coming from a previous system, the amount of cost and time and resources that went into developing yeah. legal education and yeah. so on and so forth, I mean, it depends. So they're, they're having some sort of, uh, sort of like an auctioning thing, I think, probably would maybe make more sense so that there's sort of, sort of a, a mutual understanding of, you know, hey, like we're, we're both setting our own rate and we're coming to some sort of mutual decision for what we're worth. And so, as opposed to it being said. Um, yeah, I think that, but I think you hit on the main problem. Yeah. How do you, how do you uh, what's the sort of system you You'd have to get a lot of buy in before it actually operated. Mm -hmm. In other words, somebody, for someone to go more, ask, more than one so card is pretty, pretty remote. In right. The, in you the need beginning. thousands. Yeah. Well, that system's already in place around the world. Local exchange trading systems. Yeah. Around for so it already worked. Plus the years. Yeah, it worked in certain cities that already have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, that, that's if the people are willing to donate those services, and then you've got the thing that you have all these. How many cards can you give away? Yeah. Well, I'm just throwing these ideas out, not to say that these are the, the tested or tried true, but just to kind of get you, like I said at the beginning, get your own juices working and realize that there's a whole world out there of stuff to be discovered um, and that we need to discover them soon. We're going to save the planet and save this country. So, um, one more I'll mention. Well, by the way, uh, I've thought of ways to make canvassing more fun, canvassing games, for example. I'll give you one idea. Usually when you canvass, you're always going out in twos. So you can say with your canvas buddy, um, you can agree on a, a word or a phrase. The word could be anything, potato. The phrase could be, uh, that sucks, or something. And uh, you make a bet with your canvas buddy, whoever can get the person on the other side of the door that you're canvassing to say that word first, you win whatever you want to bet. If, if your friend has to take you out for lunch or dinner afterwards, or you, 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 or you can just be competing how many times in the two hours or three hours you're out canvassing, you can do that just and not have necessarily any reward. But it can be really a lot of fun to do. Uh, This is a uh, one that was developed. This is not necessarily fun, but it's it's a pretty smart and a very effective process. Um, it was developed by a guy named Paul Sanfuegos in Humboldt County in California, and uh, his organization, uh, which he's no longer with now, it's called Democrats United for Humboldt County Dem Democracy Unlimited, DUHC.org, I think it is the website, and they would purposely find churches that are polarized between liberals and conservatives. And they would have uh, get together in this meeting, and they would put the, t the Bill of Rights, the Ten uh, the Bill of Rights, on the uh, the main ten, the first ten, uh, on the board, and they would just go down. Uh, they first get some consensus that we all agree that these are really essential to what a democracy, a successful democracy, should be. Uh, 
and everyone would agree, well, that'd be right. Yeah, it should have at least, these amendments should, should be followed. You know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, blah, blah. And then he'd go down one by one and ask the people in this group, to what extent do we still have these things? And they would make this huge list around uh, basically wallpaper, the, the, the room, with all the ways we're losing each of these amendments, each of these rights, the Bill of Rights. And that everybody agreed on. And he would really create a huge amount of consensus just using this kind of process. And then he'd say, well, where, where do you want to start to try to get some of this back? And I'd say 90% of the time, everybody kind of agreed that where we need to start is democratizing the media. And because uh, even, you know, when MoveOn had one of its great victories, it was when they united with a lot of the right wing outfits to stop the FEC from further concentration of media ownership, uh, ownership of the media. And because um, that was obviously an area that both the right and the left would agree on. And so it's a really interesting process that I think that, that bears maybe move on or some group doing more of. It certainly can be done perhaps more on our health care and some other issues, education, some other issues like that. Um, and now it can be done about global warming. So it's becoming, you see the ads with Pat Robertson and, and uh, what's his name? Uh, you see the, the, the one with the yeah. it's, it's not Al Sharpton. Is Al it? Sharpton, yeah. And there's one with Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. And somebody, somebody, yeah. So I think that's become a, 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 an issue that both right and left can agree on. And, and uh, so we really have to try to really pursue those areas much more uh, aggressively than we're doing. So, uh, so my suggestion, and I'd like to know where you want to go from here, but my suggestion is, is I'd like to brainstorm some, here's some of your ideas. That's one, that's one way we could use up the rest of the time. Uh, another one would be, uh, just, uh, I'll write some elements on the, on the wall, and maybe you can keep in some other elements. Um, just sort of being very brainstorming, free, free, uh, no, no judgment, no criticism. And then we'll uh, ask you to take out a piece of paper and come up with one idea that would be uh, tapping, some, combining some of these elements in a creative way. And then you'll pass, you'll make it by your way, you'll have a, you'll, you divide your paper into uh, uh, six, because there's about six people here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, yeah, four, 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 four. Into, into not a quadrant, but six squares. So, so turn it horizontally. This is, by the way, a brainstorming technique um, that corporations use. Corporations are much more sophisticated and creative, basically, in how they try to come up with creative ideas. Unfortunately, it's all being used to sell you crap you don't really need, but they're they really know how to brainstorm much better than the left does. We have so much we can learn from, from business. I want to get a conference together with Jim Collins and people like that, with inviting heads of move on and RBC, Greenpeace, what the, what, the, what the movement groups can learn from entrepreneurs in big business in terms of best practice. I think that can be really powerful. Um, anyway, so that's another one of my smarter ways to organize. I forgot about that one. Um, so, so, uh, so we either so just review. We can either we can just either suggest some some smarter or more fun or more smarter and more fun ways that you you thought of or are thinking about and trying to maybe work it out. It doesn't have to be polished. You see, some of mine are not polished at all. Mine are just very germinal stage. Or you can try this brainstorming thing where I'm going to put some elements on the on the uh, on the board here and see what we can come up with right here and now in the room. How many want to do track one? How many actually have a smarter, more fun way to organize that they'd like to share? Yeah. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, well, that's good. Okay. And then how many want to do track two? Maybe there's time to do both. Uh, how many want to do track two where we try to actually create something here and now? One. Okay. So let's start with track. <laughs> let's start with track one and see if we wrap that up fast, then we'll go to uh, track two. Uh, some of the elements, by the way, fall into these areas. Um, hold on a minute, just so you can be thinking. Because also, these elements might help you further develop your idea. But uh, the categories are uh, time, place, and action. 
so uh, tell me if I'm missing some dimension. But so for time, we've got Father's Day coming up. You've got Fourth uh, of July. You've got for August. It's a it's the slowest media month. So that's by the way when Cindy Sheehan decided to sit in at Crawford, Texas, and Crawford Ranch it was August. Now, she didn't really plan it that way, but it turned out to be a very, very fortuitous time because that's me. You notice all of a sudden she got a huge amount of media. Well, the reason she got a huge amount of media is a very, August is the slowest month of the, of the year for, for the press. So she was very, very fortunate that by accident she got that inspiration to go down to Texas and, and set up a big, uh, ask President Bush to meet with her, and when, when he wouldn't, he, she just set up a permanent encampment. So place could be um, uh, sort of Starbucks, could be a supermarket. There's, when I say place, where are you going to meet strangers? Because politics is talking to strangers. Okay. Supermarket, house party, uh, corner, um, door to door. And then the action could be, um, you know, it could be uh, like this arresting the, your congressman or something. It could be having a party. Uh, actually, this the action is door to door. meeting people, and then this would be uh, people's homes. Just put your neighborhood. And can anyone think of any other things to put in this list under place or under action? This could be letter writing. Your church under place. What? Your church. Church, church. yes, thank you. But, uh, movie theater? Oh, yeah, great. <coughs> oh, I'm glad you mentioned movie theaters because one of the smarter ways I, I thought that Move On and, and Michael Moore invented to really uh, lead to some social change, but again, Move On kind of screwed up on it. But when you walked out of Fahrenheit 911, uh, if you were in any of the major cities in this country, you didn't, you weren't just, you know, the problem is when you make movies that have some social redeeming value, or you make a television show, what happens, we live in a media bombarded society, so what happens, your, your awareness goes up for all of about, you know, one, two, about 10, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and then you either channel surf to the next show, or your, your kid, a teenager, you have to start having an argument, or uh, you're, you tr you get, lost trying to find your car or get through traffic to get home after the movie. We, I mean, we live in a society that's taking distraction to an art form. Do we not? So it's very hard for media, no matter how well it's done, for any awareness increasing event to ever lead to the action you hope it will lead to. So we have to get much more sophisticated at how we can link awareness raising to action. And the beautiful example of that was when you walked out of Fair 911, Move On was there, volunteers who move on, handing you a flyer inviting you to a party where you just had to put in your zip code at the website and you'd be invited to a house party that weekend. So you could take that awareness, that outrage you had from seeing that movie and start talking to other people about what we can do. The Fortune Move On didn't use the party to ask people and to organize and say, well, what can we do? Let's, let's start doing it. You know, it was a, a conference call for Michael Moore or something. And I don't remember what it was. Probably no one else does either. But they, they didn't really, they kind of blew that opportunity. Uh, but they had the, the right structural idea when people walk out of a movie theater and hand them something that leads to some action. And I've been telling Cold Pink they've had like three Greater Rock films. There's another one just came out with Kuzak. You know, that they, all these groups could have used okay. the same way that Move On did and they blew it and didn't do it. Uh, but that would be a really smart way to organize. Yeah. 
I was going to say over at the Red Thing, the theater in San Francisco, when they show progressive films, there's usually a breakout session at the end of the film. Yeah. Where everyone goes around, shakes hands, talks to each other, right. and talk about what it is you just watched. That's yeah. really powerful. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's something else I was going to mention real quick here that I thought of. But, uh, okay, so let me hear, I want to hear now from who wants to use got a lot of just to share one of your ideas. Yes. It's, it's Gary, too. Gary, yeah. yeah. From? Quite the beginning. Okay. And uh, it's new, Richard. Something I've been engaged in, and uh, he's being distributor for the Rock Creek Food Press, which is an independent newspaper, and I get a box of them for like 10 cents a piece, and just put them there on the street. And what I've been uh, doing is go along and find abandoned paper box which is not too hard to find, surprisingly. Paper box? Yeah, like uh, Virginia Times is one that came out oh, a few years ago yeah. and then it went bust. Yeah. Well, all the boxes are still on the street. Right. And anybody can come along and pick them up and they just, they just abandon them. They've been out of business for like a few years. So you, you can take it home and take off the coin operated part so it's just a free box and paint it up, put a decal on it. If you, and put it back on the street and load it up with newspapers. And then people can come on this paper. And you can put a flyer in it with information on your local community. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. And you, 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 you'd uh, cover the box with something that would be enticing for people to well, stop the war or you know, save the plant. Display where you can put it, the front page of the yeah. page. Yeah, this now, or? yeah, I've got one box and I've got three more in the pipeline. Uh -huh. What's the paper in the It's called rockcreekfreepress.com. And you can, uh, you can... I think I picked one up here. Yeah, that's one of them. Well, that reminds me of the other day, the supermarket idea. Is I get so angry. How many people get angry when they're in the supermarket line and they see these celebrity upset? <laughs> Choir, the National Choir, really and all this stuff about what uh, some movie stars. That's the only time I get my good reading. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, am I the only one that gets angry when they see oh, it's so it's mindless? Really and, and what goes out of my head all the time is so fucking what? So what? That is, I just imagine. So and so is pregnant with somebody else's baby. Someone else is, you know, screwed somebody else. Uh, someone's about to leave. Some star is about to leave. Some other star. And I'm saying to my head, so, so what? So take a minute to introduce yourself and then the one thing you learned or are still hoping to learn maybe, they're frustrated you haven't learned or some way it changed you. Uh, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, so my name is Alex Slavich. I'm visiting from San Francisco, although I'm currently in Knoxville, Tennessee at the moment. Um, I'm working on a project that's called Entrepreneur. It combines altruism and entrepreneur into one word. It's a book, it's a film, it's a website. Uh, Pretty much, in a nutshell, it's about people who have reached financial freedom through triple bottom line entrepreneurship. They define wealth not by their net worth, but by the amount of the free time that they have in their life, while living a simple, sustainable, ecologically friendly lifestyle to focus on social change on either a local or a larger international level. So, proud is definitely sort of this inclusive philosophy that is a very um, good tool out of many tools to say, hey, you know, this is sort of what these people are working towards towards creating. So. Um, that's what keeps me occupied that is a lot of traveling and doing uh, freelance article writing in the meantime for that. Um, this is it a book or a video? Uh, both. So, um, there, and I, I don't even know how to summarize what all this, all, all this stuff here. I, I think what, I would say that I think what's, in, what's inspired me from the conference is that there are a lot of ideas here. I think a lot of them are ideas that we've already heard before. But what I'm really inspired by are what are the concrete examples, whether it's pieces of the legislation or specific programs or taking away the action steps. Um, and that's why I was inspired to come to this thing in terms of int really interested in how do you build communities, not just in a virtual sense, because I think right now with the web, there are numerous technologies out there that can help bring people together, but also learning some more about fun and creative ways, because all social change has to start from building a strong system community. Otherwise, if you don't have that foundation, nothing else can really sprout. So, and what's your name again? It's Alex Lavage. 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 L e v i e g e.
What's that? I, that's in Knoxville. Um, I went to Oregon State University for some time and I transferred over to the University of Iowa, but this is a solo project. So. How do you spell, how do you spell uh, It's uh, Altrupeer, so A-L-T-R-U, P-R-E-N-E-U-R. I know, I'd like to see you afterwards because I'm an entrepreneur, an okay. internet entrepreneur, and an activist, and it's neat that you're doing that. And that's how we're doing uh, my vocation. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my name's Harry Hall, I'm from Knoxville, too. And uh, I'll tell you, I, I didn't think there was anybody to the left of me, but I, I found that there are some. <laughs> and uh, I, it's, I found a lot of new ideas, and uh, I think I've moved a little bit to the left, too. I mean, some of them have convinced me. And uh, I, I met someone from Iraq, and it was really nice to get her viewpoint on, on her feelings about the war. And, uh, and, and that's about it. My name is Antoinette Van Rail. I'm from Winston Salem, North can, Carolina. Can we and see your face? Hi. And um, this is my first session, so I really don't have an assessment of the other presentations. And, and well, she's being little modest. She's an attorney in the family court. Family and immigration law. And she's from Jamaica, so you've seen uh, what America's done in third world countries. I'm close. The CIA, the whole bit. What else is here from uh, Either of you, gentlemen. My name is Gary Baya. I'm from uh, Quentin, Virginia. And I am the one of the grassroots uh, activists for 9-11 Truth in Richmond, Virginia been associated with the uh, truth movement for over four years. Um, we have a very small group in Richmond, and I'm interested in learning ways to make it much larger. I'm Jim Beer. I'm from Fair, Virginia, I'm about an hour south of here, and I've been involved in peace and so forth kind of work. And come to realize that if you want peace, work for justice, and so I'm working uh, myself on trying to promote fair trade, specifically with uh, churches um, and the Episcopal communion, uh, beginning with my own diocese here in Southwest Virginia. And that came out of being in Nicaragua in 1985 and returning last summer, and then again this past January. You're working with which denomination? Or several. Mr. Patty, right now. That's my own. We're, local, we're sharing a, a minute about church. who we are. Gary Green? I'm Gary Green. Great place. And, and, we're, and, what, and one thing that you, know, you learned from the conference or somehow you got changed you at the conference. You're the last person to go. No, you're not. Uh, no, you're not. Uh, I get to say so something, too. To I, just because I have a camera. <laughs> To make it like the one guy, this uh, the revolution, talking about some fun and funny things that you do using humor as a way to affect change as well. Who was that? Uh, that was. Which was uh, here? From Mitchell Cohen. He was talking uh, about the elevator, elevator story. Yeah, right. The elevator story and the, uh, the Geiger counter with the guy going into the. the uh, uh, with you know the radioactive suits and Geiger counters that would go off when they came close to GMO products, and then shutting down the, the store. But you've got uh, 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 genetically modified food. L listen, <laughs> and he shut down like a score of uh, different shopping centers as a result. Of them, it raised the issue. Mitchell Cohen. Yeah. And where's he? New York. Did he get arrested? The, um, is this the guy who dealt with it before last night? No. No. No, so I was wondering. Uh, so to revisit that, I've done the street theater and various things. Because this movement to be engaging has to be something that people want to join. It's entertaining to be an activist, to be fun and to be out there, and to prevent burnout. You know, many of us have been doing this for a while and they realize 
After a while, you know, excuse me, can we? Can we? Yeah. It's only so long you can go against against the case. How about here's for the solution? Mother Teresa talked about she won't go to an anti war project, but just for sure, she would go to a peace market. That I have that start getting the thinking and the creative juice is going to involve people in ways that's inclusive and um, creates movement. That's, you know, each person that you contact becomes part of it, becomes a new spark that sparks other people's interests. And there's the old adage that people are rarely do the right thing uh, for the right reasons, but they'll do it a lot for the wrong reasons, the wrong motivations, and, or just motivations that are relevant and I think fun is a very important motivation that we need to get much better at using. It's the fun side of compassion. So wisdom, compassion, put into action. Ellen? Yeah, um, I'm Ellen Thomas. I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, I tried a creative way of uh, communicating for 18 years, being out in front of the White House with uh, signs that said, God, wisdom, honesty, and convert the war machines. And, um, and we were considered quite colorful hippies and bums and moon attacks and crap. And, but at least we communicated with a lot of people, which is a wonderful way. It's a wonderful way to communicate if you don't have a lot of money and you do have some time. Uh, is to find a place where people can consistently find you and, and where it's public and hopefully uh, a, a turnover of public. That if not even where office workers come and go or whatever to, to become seen, and that motivates and. and encourages other people to do. And we brought an idea to the voters, which won the election, and uh, that is a really wonderful way of um, organizing, too, because you go to people, you're not saying, uh, will you sign my petition to abolish nuclear weapons and convert the war machines to provide for human needs, solar panels, and many mills, not missiles and bombs, which makes them um, want to walk away. You could say to them, will you sign my petition to allow me to bring this idea to the voters in a voter initiative? Uh, it doesn't matter what your opinion is, just sign so I can bring it to the voters and then you make up your mind and you can vote however you want. The one way is maybe 90% no, This the, the other way is 90% yes. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way of organizing and getting ideas out, even if you don't get the 5% of the vote voters to sign the petition. Even if you don't get it on the ballot, it still is a marvelous tool. And you make a lot of contacts and, and um, empower a lot of people. And if you don't have voter initiatives where you live, then get them. Um, it's best to do it on a small scale, towns, villages, um, counties, rather than on a large scale. There's 24 states that have statewide initiatives. Frankly, I'd be terrified of the statewide initiative myself because it, it requires a lot of coordination, a lot of money, um, a lot of manpower. A, a few people can get something on the ballot in your in your town, and it's a wonderful tool. So, um, and something that inspired me from this uh, this there's wonderful people here. I mean, it's great. You know, that, that I was at the Iraq Vets for Peace um, thing yesterday, and and uh, it was asked, how many of you here have been arrested for what you believe? And 99% of people <laughs> raised their hand. That, this is the kind of crap I like to do. <laughs> but uh, the suggestion of that inspires me to do more research and investigate how to do this is citizen arrests that came up. Um, in the uh, uh, indict Bush Cheney workshop, uh, and I think it's really it's a wonder, that would be a wonderful tool too to have a collection of people who somehow or another, and I think maybe through a voter initiative could be empowered to go after the government officials. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. And that was the gist of my workshop down the hall that didn't happen. Hours ago, yeah. So at least I got to say it to somebody. <laughs> well, if it's any consolation, the workshop here that was going on with yours, there was only two people that weren't leaders, and I think it's because everybody was watching Cindy. Right. You know, how was that, by the way? Uh, 
Um, well, I didn't get to stay, but I told you.